All right, there we go. Now it's uh, another globe spinning. Very cool. Took me hours to make that, so I wanted to make sure you guys saw it. Um, yeah, hey everyone. Really great to be here. I'm excited to talk about what it is we're building. I'm Michael Elliott from, yeah. And I'm Theo, as introduced from France. Obviously, we just got introduced, so no need for that again. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to, to going through uh, what it is we're building and uh, the tech involved and explaining how we built it and also uh, why we built it. So I'm pretty sure everyone in this room is quite familiar uh, with the fact that online identity verification sucks. I think everyone here has had the experience of um, taking a photograph of your passport and sending it off to some service for, for KYC verification. Um, you know, that you've got to basically trust them to keep that data safe. Uh, hint, they won't. There's been, you know, many, many um, hacks and data leaks uh, throughout recent years that just demonstrates that it's, you know, very difficult for companies to keep that kind of data um, secure. And this inevitably leads to, yeah, theft and uh, uh, identity theft and fraud. And another downside of this is that you can't bring it on chain. So another more recent kind of um, threat to this particular this model is generative AI. Um, this is becoming increasingly advanced and uh, easy to access. So this is an example of uh, a fake ID generated by a service called OnlyFakes. So it's, it's currently possible to pay like $15 and you can have a, a really genuine, authentic-looking government-issued document created. So you know, a high school, uh, high school kid could do this, find a, a profile photo of someone on like, Twitter, and then easily generate something that would fool the KYC of, uh, of some services. In fact, the article that um, this is from originally, um, they tried it out, and they actually managed to KYC on a crypto exchange. And I think it's just going to get easier and easier for this to be the case. So this completely breaks the model of um, taking a photograph of your documents and sending it in. So what if instead of this, what if instead um, you could reveal only what you absolutely needed to reveal for a particular service? So for example, if you just needed to reveal uh, your country and nothing more, then that's all that you, you, you need to disclose. Um, and what if you could generate uh, unforgeable one-time proofs so one time in the sense that you can't replay these. So once they're user consumed by the service, um, they can't use it again. So unlike a photograph, which would obviously be, you know, if it's stolen, it could be reused. Um, what if you could prove that you're a person and, and not an AI or a bot who holds a valid passport and reveal nothing else about yourself? Um, and what if you could use this on chain? I think we'd all agree in this room that that would be pretty damn cool. And so, uh, okay, Mike, that's great. That sounds wonderful. But like, how do we actually get there? Great question, Mike. Well, let me, let me explain. So most people uh, might not be aware of this, although maybe you are now, um, given uh, the, the booth and there's you know, kind of more, more awareness of this. But everybody in this room, um, on your, your passports, your e-passports that were issued by your government, on the NFC chip, there's your personal information. And your issuing government has digitally signed over this information, essentially attesting to its authenticity and creating like a tamper-proof seal. So we're able to verify these signatures. Um, we leverage this existing infrastructure um, of essentially like a government part, uh, signatures and route certificates um, that are used by airports around the world every day for, by, by governments to protect their, their borders. So that's the kind of level of security. We, we take those signatures and we can verify them um, in zero knowledge. And then, and then eventually we can, uh, now there's another circuit, we can disclose that um, selectively. And this allows the creation of these private and unforgeable proofs of identity. And so you can actually leverage this. So we're going to show you the app later, but as a developer, you can easily integrate this. Can you just Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> So we have built like a SDK, which is going to be usable, easy to, easy to plug for any JavaScript or web developers, whether it's in the context of Web 2 or Web, web 3, whatever kind of web app. So it's really friendly, strongly typed TypeScript SDK, so it's intuitive to use, to choose which kind of field you need from the passport, what kind of information you want. 
it's going to really unlock like, a lot of interesting use cases. We thought about some, uh, but we're really curious to see what people can build with it. Maybe they're going to come up with something we didn't think about, so that's something we're really curious about. And this is fully non-profit public goods, so it's like free to use, there's no restriction, there's no payment, nothing. You just plug it in and you're free to go, no API key whatsoever. So here's an example of how it would look. So that's the first version of our SDK, so TypeScript, so you specify your domain name, the name, the purpose of what you're trying to do with what the, peop the visitors or users of your website. And you will get the URL, which encodes all the parameters you requested, all the fields you parameters, and then you can encode that into a QR code, and let the user scan it from the app. And then you will get the information with the proof in some of the callback, like on proof generated, that you requested. Uh, the next step is that we're going to build like a React SDK, so it's even easier to use. We're going to take care of all the UI and UX flow, so you don't have to take care of that. So it's really one button and everything will be handled. Cool, and um, yeah, so this section, we're gonna go over uh, kind of the differences between custodial versus self-custodial. And if it wasn't already obvious about the colors that I chose, um, one is good and one is bad. And just to kind of maybe like reinforce that, uh, yeah, this is the bad one and this is the good one, <laughs> okay? So, uh, so for custodial identity verification, as kind of like uh, conceptually, this is how it currently works. So you're issuing government uh, of, of your passport or other government document. They'll, they'll provide it to you, and then you'll be so that, also like digitally signing over it. In the example of a passport or a national ID card, you'll then uh, take a photograph of it, and then you'll provide that to a KYC provider who will then maybe do a bunch of lookups in a private database, and then eventually they'll just kind of let the service know, um, you know, yep, this is Michael, no, this is not. Um, and the issue with this model here is you have a, like, it's not really end-to-end, -end, and so you lose the trust provenance uh, along the route through this counterparty. So it's kind of like it's wasted because the government are testing to it originally, and then that gets broken when you have this third party that has to reattest to it. Uh, there's a reliance on this, this third party. Another downside is, is it's all or nothing. So you're taking a, you know, a whole photograph of the passport. Um, fraud is much easier with this approach because, like I mentioned before, generative AI, you know, that's coming. It's going to get better. Uh, it's also quite expensive. So sometimes they need to fall back to manual verification, which can, can be costly for businesses, which doesn't scale very well. And I guess this is kind of like the, you know, the big issue with it, really one of the major issues is you've got to rely on them to keep your data safe, and they often don't, which really sucks. And so contrasting to that, you've got self-custodial identity verification, which is truly end-to-end. -end. And so in this model, the government's you know, digitally signing over your documents or attesting to these facts about you and providing it to you, and then you can use, uh, you can use zero knowledge proofs here to uh, verify the signatures in, in zero knowledge and then selectively reveal what it is you want to and provide that proof directly to the actual service, end to end. There's no other uh, you know, middlemen that need to be involved in this. Even us, we just create the circuits um, that, to facilitate this, but we aren't really the middleman. And another great way to kind of think about this is who better to attest to, the, to, attest to your identity and your, your personal information than the same entity that issued you your birth certificate. So you, know, you change your name or, or you get married, who do you go to, right? You, you go to your government. And it's also another way to think about it, it, it's kind of decentralized across the whole world in the sense that each government around the world, they're attesting to these facts about their own citizens of their country. And so onto some, some interesting use cases here for ZK Passport. There's really a myriad of different possibilities, um, but we'll just go over a, a few that kind of popped out to us is quite interesting and compelling. Uh, private and compliant private tokens. So we're currently building out uh, a wallet called Obsidian Wallet on Aztec Network, and we want to have privacy as the default and be able to have these stable coins like USDC on ramped and then be used completely privately. So you can actually have um, this peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, private cash for, for using it for just normal everyday transactions without worrying about 
uh, privacy concerns and everyone seeing your full tra transaction history. And so, uh, yeah, in the future, we hope to have this um, integrated into Obsidian Wallet. So we're going to have basically ZK Passport as this kind of first class citizen, uh, f first class uh, citizen for identity, um, as identity provider that will be able to automatically generate proofs uh, whenever uh, you know, you're transferring US USDC around. And so some, some, maybe some examples here of the proofs that would be generated. So you'd have like uh, compliance proofs, which would prove maybe that you're not in an OFAC SCN list, you're not from a, a sanctioned country. And then another option here could be maybe using this unique identifier that is the same for every passport, um, but also completely anonymous. You could track like transfers over time. So you might impose like a super generous limit of maybe 100,000 USDC per month. That's enough for like 99.99% of people but that's going to severely limit uh, like, you know, bad actors from, from laundering lots of money through this. And ultimately, it's going to mean that you can off-ramp onto an exchange and not have to be worried about the exchange you know, banning your account um, because you've used this, this, sort of, this private and compliant token. Another use case could be proof of personhood, so you can have increasable resistance. So both in the context of Web 2 and 3 is quite important. You want to prevent spam and bots. For example, you can have a social media platform that wants to really have one person or one account, so you can do that much more easily with this solution. Or like simply the use case we use nowadays, a CAPTCHA, you could replace that with a proof of pers passport. That would be much stronger. Another one is uh, being able to prove you know, your name is really what you say it is on social media. So you can imagine like a, a, ver you know, a decentralized kind of way to do this with a verified name badge. You just prove your first and last name that was attested by some recognized government. And then you could, you could have that on social media as a, a proof of name. And another strong use case is proof of age. So there's some country that's tied to impose age gating on some websites, such as adult content. I know that because France is actually the country where I'm from is doing that. They impose this legally speaking, so, but they want to do it privacy preserving way. They still care about privacy, which is nice to hear from the government. So that's one use case as well. Um, so here, if you wanted to know which country actually support e-passport or electronic passport, this is all the country in blue. So that covers a pretty big chunk of the world, so over 150 countries. So this is an open standard uh, set out by the ICAO, which is an um, institution of the United Nations. So it's actually quite widely supported. You will notice that India is not part of it. It's like a big country that's not actually part of it. For that country, you would have solution like Ananadar, which actually supports that kind of like alternative system. Uh, but others, like Passport, is pretty good. There's some disparities in the signature algorithm, though, so they don't always use the same kind of signatures, so we have to adapt to that. So it's not fully standardized, but there's some flexibility to the standards, but it's already quite good. Another thing I want to point out is that national IDs, especially in the EU, also support that standard sometimes, even residence permits, so we can extend to that. And the EU is also pushing generally for digital identity uh, with their EU digital identity wallet and the general identity framework they're pushing with EIDAS. And to give a bit of an overview here of the, um, the hierarchy of how this works, it's very similar to PKI with like the current, the, the, the current web and SSL certificates. You have this organization called ICAO and, uh, and ICAO, they, they are under the UN and uh, they collect through diplomatic channels these reach certificates from different countries. And then these REIT certificates, they then sign these intermediate certificates called DSCs or document signing certificates. And then those certificates, they sign the actual e-passport data itself. So I'm gonna go do a quick overview. This is, this is how circuits work. So essentially, we get most of our data from what we call the data group one. So it's like visible on the passport, so the two bottom lines. So it's like containing the name, the date of birth, and other information where you can derive a lot of inform information that generally people want. And this is hashed into content with the rest of the data, which itself is signed. So this is what is interesting, because that signed data is then we can verify it with the certificate mentioned by Michael, the root trust chain, go all the way up to the root certificate. That way we're sure that that data has been issued and signed by the state. And from that we can derive proof of country, proof of age, while being sure that's coming from a verifiable source, 
without revealing anything else about the information of the document. Um, so, cool, great. And uh, so rather than just talk about it, let's actually dive in and, and take a look at what ZK Passport um, looks like and how it works. So this is ZK Passport, and the first step here is I'm going to tap my um, government issue passport against the phone, and it'll read the passport data in by NFC. And then once that's done, you'll see it come up here. So that's me loaded into ZK Passport. And then the next step is just to connect it with the DAP so we can actually generate some identity proofs. This is a, an integration that we did with DevCon, and this allowed people who were from Southeast Asia to prove they're from one of the countries from Southeast Asia, um, but nothing else about themselves. And then they're able to get a discount voucher applied to their purchase of their DevCon ticket. So to do that, you simply click uh, on the Continue button here. This will generate a QR code, which I'll then scan with my phone. And then that will prompt, that will prompt me to... Um, which it'll prompt me to prove the particular credentials that are being asked of me from this service. In this case, it's just my country, um, and that's completely up to the developer that's integrating this. So I will hit uh, accept. This will generate the zero knowledge proof on my phone. It'll then be sent via the secure end to end encrypted WebSocket, where it's then verified um, either on the back end or even um, on a smart contract. Uh, we. Uh, we were recently blessed by, uh, from a, with a visit from uh, Father Vitalik at our booth, just around the corner outside. So please feel free to come by. Um, we've got it for the rest of the day. And um, we have a workshop on tomorrow in Classroom B at 12 p.m. So if you'd like to learn more about our SDK and, uh, and, and how it works, please come by and, yeah, you can chat with us. Sick. And I guess lastly, one, one last QR code. <laughs> Uh, we have a demo available. It works best on desktop. It's the one we were using at the booth. Um, so yeah, there's a QR code if you want to try it out. And you'll be able to load your passport in. It supports both Android and iOS. Um, yeah, but if you have any issues with that, please reach out to us and we can help you out. All right. Round of applause. <laughs> give it up, give it up. OK, cool. So we have a couple of minutes left, maybe time for two questions. And uh, let's just go up at the top, too. So, um, I think you guys could just read that and answer it, yeah? Yeah, let's go cool. for it. Um, so regarding Noir as a DSL, as a system, so how did you land on Noir as the DSL for a circuit? Does your system interact with Aztec itself? So first question, um, Noir, so why did we choose that? Um, we did choose it pretty early on when it was still uh, quite unstable, but now it's pretty stable. So Noir, I see it as a very um, good language. If you want to do ZK DSL, you should do ZK DSL. That's maintainable toward the future. The Aztec team is pretty reliable. They're a good team, so you can rely on them. And it's a universal language, which means you can have like a single code base and switch your backend for a different one if you want, a different proving scheme. So you can still just improve uh, with the whatever latest improvement has been done in ZK while still maintaining the same code base so that I found this pretty powerful. As for whether we interact with Aztec itself, so ZK Passport is blockchain agnostic, like the protocol itself is blockchain agnostic, but as mentioned by Michael, we're building this wallet called Obsidian, which, yes, that one's going to be interactive with Aztec specifically and going to integrate ZK Passport for compliance and privacy mixed with identity at the wallet level on Aztec. But yeah, there's no reason this can't be used on other chains like Alio or even like an Ethereum lay one. Um, but it's most suitable, I suppose, on privacy chains where you can have these uh, proof data um, more private, yeah, more privately. Um, how do you handle the UX problem of convincing users that their passport photo remains client side? That's a great question. I think this is going to be a challenge, and it's going to come down to to brand trust and basically building that up over time. So we've got open source circuits and, and open source code base. I think that's going to be that's going to help for sure. Uh, and just being like credibly neutral, um, you know, people can trust this as a, as a as a brand that's going to respect privacy. It's one of our, our core values. So that's just going to take time, I think, and and you know, demonstrating it through our actions. Okay, make.